Hello and welcome. We'll have you all arrive into our webinar tonight, Green Hydrogen, how hydro to hydrogen schemes are the latest false climate solution. We'll just um, wait a while until we fill in the numbers. You're all rolling in. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce myself, but I'd also like to start by acknowledging that I am on Aboriginal land. Uh, I am coming to you from Lutruwita, Tasmania, uh, Southern Island of Australia. I'm Jenny Weber from the Bob Brown Foundation, and I'm your MC tonight. We are gathering tonight to talk about and learn about the growing interest in green hydrogen and the concerns from communities on the social and environmental impacts. Uh, I have some uh, information that will help you understand us tonight. Um, if you are English or French speaking, there are interpreters for tonight's presentation. And down the bottom of your screen, there is a button that you could please press on interpretation at the bottom bar on the Zoom. Please follow these instructions. Choose French or English, and then press mute original audio. So I will repeat these instructions again. Um, but for those of you who have just joined us, please at the bottom bar of the Zoom, you can see a button called interpretation. It's in between record and reactions. Please press that and you will hear from our interpreters for tonight's presentation. If you are English or French speaking, press the language down the bottom of the interpretation bar and follow these instructions for you to then press mute original audio, which is in the same button. Our event tonight is brought to you by Bob Brown Foundation, International Rivers, CORAP and CODED. It's a wonderful uh, collaboration from across the globe to talk to you about green hydrogen and the problems with um, that very notion that hydrogen is green when there are uh, very real problems across the globe, people suffering from the impacts. Uh, with questions and answers this evening, you will be able to, at the end of the evening, put your hand up and we will allow for people to ask questions of our speakers. Um, we will also be recording, so please understand that we are recording tonight's event and uh, we also would love you in the chat to let us know which country and city are you coming from tonight so we can see where you're from and um, as you're enjoying the company of our eight speakers, we can learn more about you. So we have an incredible lineup of eight speakers tonight, including Dr. Saul Griffith from Australia, uh, Christine Milne also from Australia. We will then uh, have Emmanuel Masuyu and Eric Kasongo and Daniel Ribeiro talking about case examples of problems with green hydrogen. And we also have Pablo Brait from Market Forces who will be talking to us about um, his experiences from their organisation with international campaigns. We have the wonderful International Rivers, um, Demata Coffey and Siziwi Mota, who will also be talking with us and sharing information about the International Rivers campaign. And please stick around to the end because there'll be a great call to action and how you can be involved in the ongoing campaign. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our video. A very important uh, start to these sorts of webinars is to place us in the incredible uh, environments that we're working to protect and hear about what the threats are. So um, produced by International Rivers, first of the previous Inga River three dams has had devastating impacts. So over to the video, thank you. The mighty Congo River is Africa's second longest river after the Nile. In terms of flow, it's second only to the Amazon. With a basin spanning most of the Democratic Republic of Congo and parts of six neighboring countries, the river has been a vital lifeline for centuries, forming with its tributaries a vast inland waterway that allows access to places still inaccessible by road. The river nourishes immense biodiversity it's home to at least 700 fish species, and it supports the world's second largest rainforest, the Congo Rainforest. The river also empties water and sediment into one of the largest carbon sinks in the world, the Congo Plume in the Atlantic. Despite the river's importance, threats of a new mega dam continue. The proposed Inga Dam's impacts on climate change and biodiversity would be significant. 
It would flood the Bundi Valley, trapping sediments, causing methane emissions and harming the climate-regulating mid-Atlantic plume, which is key to the planet's carbon cycle. Transmission lines would also clear huge swaths of forest. Hydropower companies have targeted the river for decades. The country commissioned two disastrous, corruption-laden projects in 1972 and 1982, Inga 1 and Inga 2. These projects displaced thousands, destroyed livelihoods and impoverished generations while plunging the country into debt. The dams never generated the power promised. 84% of Congolese people still lack access to electricity. But the debacle inspired a civil society movement that demands reparations for displaced residents as well as just energy transition. Multiple funders have pulled out, including BHP Bulletin and the World Bank, citing viability and local opposition to the dam. In 2021, the latest foreign investor, FFI, was making a bid for a new hydro-to-hydrogen scheme, the latest false climate solution. Inga 3's dam reservoir would displace an estimated 10,000 people, the majority of whom would lose both their land and their livelihood. Imagine these communities who have already been affected by these problems to be localized encore. So these are people who will be doubly affected. Et si déjà aujourd'hui leur vie est précaire, parce qu'il faut dire que c'est des communautés rurales qui vivent dans la pauvreté et qui dépendent totalement de la terre pour vivre et dont les moyens de subsistance s'amenuisent au jour le jour. A vibrant and growing civil society movement, including women and Inga 1 and 2 dam survivors, is working to change the country's development path. Mule nda tuba po kura de le stage, beto beto kena njungu ya kura, me beto kena de le stage, ele ni benefici beto kena kubaka na kura mule. Andrew Forrest, FFI's plan for production of green hydrogen, is aimed at providing fuel for European markets not serving the DRC population. Put simply, the Congolese people need power. Yet for decades, their government has pursued the expensive, delay-played Inga Dam project while ignoring affordable and quicker to deploy alternatives, the country's vast wind and solar resources. A recent study found that the DRC's abundant wind and solar potential could transform the country's energy sector. The DRC can harness renewable energy to power the country faster and more affordably than currently planned projects like Inga Dam Project. very very much to uh, International Rivers for making that. Uh, thank you to who joined us more recently. I'm Jenny, I'm the MC tonight from the Bob Brown Foundation. Our next speaker is uh, Sizewa Mota, our first speaker from International Rivers tonight to um, talk to us about tonight's event and um, introduce a fact sheet. So please welcome Sizewa. Oh, thank you so much Jenny. Um, and thank you all for joining this webinar. We're really happy to see that there's been such a, an interest in the topic. Um, International Rivers has been monitoring the Inga Hydropower Project for several years now. Um, and we've been supporting colleagues and communities in the Democratic Republic of Congo in their opposition to the Inga project, um, particularly over its huge environmental, social, biodiversity impacts, um, the cost of the project, and the fact that the projects essentially wouldn't be addressing the dire energy um, access needs um, for the DRC. I mean, over the years, we've seen so many iterations of INGA, um, but more recently, we found that the project has become embroiled in this hydrogen hype. Um, and we started hearing about green hydrogen you know, as being the latest silver bullet to address climate change. And it was for the first time 
with this project that we came across a proposal for hydropower to produce green hydrogen. Um, and we'll hear from other speakers as well, I think, but Andrew Forrest um, is a key player in all of this. Um, he is the head of Fortescue Futures Industries, which is a subsidiary of Fortescue Metals Group, an, an Australian mining company. And he, you know, he has started or stated his intent to develop the Engesite for the purpose of producing green hydrogen. Um, the company has since secured rights from the government of the DRC to develop um, Inga. Um, and he's also signed major agreements to sell hydrogen to firms in Germany, in the UK, where there's currently quite a, a high demand um, for hydrogen. So we've also subsequently, you know, been hearing of plans for other mega dams that have you know, been sitting on the shelf for decades, who are now all of a sudden being dusted off and being framed um, as green hydrogen projects from Papua New Guinea projects, a project in Mozambique that Daniel will speak about, Paraguay and, you know, and many others. Um, so we, we then, you know, we set out to conduct our own research to try and understand, you know, what is this hype about? Where is this hype coming from? Um, we then packaged what we've learned into a fact sheet. Um, that fact sheet is available today on our website. It's both in English and in French, and I will share the link um, in the chat so that uh, people can get access to it. We then also spoke to groups, you know, to the likes of Bob Brown, Corap, Coded, and, and, you know, realizing that there is really an appetite out there and among ourselves to learn more about this green hydrogen phenomenon. Um, and that's how we came to organizing this, this event. So together with, with the three other partners um, on, on, on this call, we really sought to, through the event, uh, through the webinar, we want to provide an understanding of, you know, what is hydro to hydrogen? What is the science behind it? And I mean, is it really green? We want to unpack what green hydrogen will actually be used for and what would be the implications for countries like the DRC, which really have such a, a low rate of electrification. Um, we also hope to provide a platform to hear about some of the hydro projects um, in Africa that are proposed for hydrogen production like Mpandankrua and understand what the impacts of course um, of that will be for the citizens of those countries. Um, and lastly, we really want to hear from colleagues, you know, also about successful efforts um, where they have been able to successfully challenge destructive mega projects. We want to find out and learn from those lessons um, and how those can be applied. Um, you know, for the hydro to hydrogen projects that, that we are um, challenging. So thank you again. And we really look forward to engaging with all of you um, in this hour and a half uh, together. Thank you. Back to you, Jean. Thank you so much. And thank you to International Rivers for pulling us together this evening. Uh, thanks for all of you who have joined us tonight and for some of you who have come in late. Um, I'm Jenny, I'm from the Bob Brown Foundation and here is our Zoom event with International Rivers, Green Hydrogen, Green of course, um, in question. Uh, our next speaker is Dr Saul Griffith. Uh, Dr Saul Griffith is an inventor, an entrepreneur, an engineer and the author of the book Electrify, also The Big Switch, uh, co-founder and chief scientist of Rewiring Australia and Rewiring America. Please welcome Dr Saul Griffith. Over to you, Dr Griffith. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to lay out the basics of hydrogen and green hydrogen and talk about uh, basically try and explode the myth or the hype. Uh, as a molecule, I call it hyperogen. Um, because of that hype, uh, and hopefully we can spread that meme and uh, put 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 this idea in its place. I'm going to go to a presentation now. Um, if I get too technical, give me feedback, and I'll I'll try and bring it up a level. But I, I want to give everyone a strong background in in the reality of hydrogen. Just before I do that, to give you some 
knowledge, uh, I have worked on multiple projects involving hydrogen technology with the US Department of Energy. I commercialized hydrogen tanks for vehicles. I do think it is a very small component of our decarbonization pathway. I also developed hydrogen compressors, so I'm not an alien to it. I'm not completely against it. Uh, that is to say, I'm knowledgeable enough to tell you why it's not a good idea at enormous scales and particularly driven from hydroelectricity. So here we go with slides to that effect. So representing Rewiring Australia or, or Rewiring America tonight, um, addressing the question of, of hydrogen, uh, hydroelectricity to make hydrogen, and is it a good idea? So first, with the very basics, um, people will talk about a few different types of hydrogen. Uh, it's, it is true to say that the majority of the world's hydrogen today is made as a byproduct of the natural gas industry. Very, very, very little at all uh, is made electrolytically. Um, so the first thing to notice about that is the current player with an economic interest in hydrogen is the global natural gas industry, and they are behind heavy, heavy lobbying for it. People talk now about three different types of hydrogen, that hydrogen that exists today is grey hydrogen, uh, steam methane reformation creates it from natural gas. Blue hydrogen is the idea that we will create the hydrogen from natural gas and then sequester the carbon dioxide. Um, that's an even more expensive and even worse way to make hydrogen than grey hydrogen. Green hydrogen is the idea that we will make clean renewable hydrogen, starting with clean renewable electricity. And so that's really the type of hydrogen we will be talking about tonight. This next slide is a little bit complicated. So I'm just gonna show you that I've done my homework. Up here is a green electricity. Uh, up here is also green electricity. This talks about pathways. If I start with electricity, because remember hydrogen is not an energy source, it's a storage mechanism, it's like a battery. If I start with normal electricity, I go into a battery and I convert it back to electricity or to motion to drive a car, and that's about 80% efficient. If I go from electricity into hydrogen, I have to go through all of these processes, whether that's electrolysis, compression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And by the time I come back to being electricity or shaft power or torque to move something, um, I've lost most of the energy and most of the pathways for hydrogen are 15 to 50% efficient. So inherently not as efficient. Once you've created the electricity, you should just use it as electricity. So now to belabor that point a little bit, what is what hydrogen might be useful for? So you can look at this and say, is hydrogen good for electricity storage? So here we are at the top. This is the all electric pathway. If I have electrons created with solar or wind, which is the cheapest electricity available right now, about 95% of it goes into the battery. A little bit is lost in the battery and then coming out again, round trip to come back as electricity, about 90% of my electricity that went in, I get back and about 10% is waste. If however, I do electricity to hydrogen, uh, I first I have to do electrolysis, which in the best case is only 83% efficient. So you lose 17% straight away. It's actually more likely to only be 70% efficient and you lose 30%. Then you have to compress the hydrogen, which is uh, about uh, also limited by physics to only be about 70% efficient in compression. So I'm going to lose another bit. Then I have to transport it and the hydrogen is a, the smallest molecule there is. It easily leaks out of all the types of containers and tanks we put it in. And so it will leak in the transportation, whether that's through a pipeline or whether that's through tanks. And then ultimately, if I burn it at the end, I only get half of the energy out when I burn it. So if I started with electricity that was green from solar or wind, and I go through hydrogen to try and be electricity again, I only get 35% back in the best case and I waste about two thirds of it. If you could also do electricity to hydrogen back to electricity via fuel cell, same story, you're gonna lose 60%. So it's not a very good idea for storage as opposed to just doing it with batteries or in fact with pumping pumped hydro, which is pumping hydroelectricity uphill. 
Is it good for transportation? Same story. Start with green solar on the left at the top here. Once it's moving the wheels of an electric car, I'm using about 83% of that green electricity. If I convert the electricity to hydrogen, then I compress it, I transport it, I burn it in a motor. Again, I lose two thirds of it. The same is true if I try to use it for low temperature heat. If I have electricity and I use modern electric heat pump technology, for every 100, one unit of electricity, I get three units of heat. However, if I go through hydrogen to do the same thing, I'll only, I'll get less than half as much if I, um, and so it's just not a good idea for low temperature heat. It's not a good, it's a better idea for high temperature heat. So low temperature heat is basically anything under boiling temperature. High temperature heat is the type of temperatures that you need for industry. The all electric pathway is 88% efficient for high temperature heat. Uh, it's only about 50% or 60% efficient for going through hydrogen via combustion or through hydrogen to electricity. Again, big losses. So it really isn't a good idea. Some people then try to tell you that hydrogen is good for its energy density. So sorry about the numbers, but this is just to put pay to the myth. So they'll tell you that hydrogen has an energy density of 123 megajoules per kilogram. That is true of the molecule. Petrol and diesel by comparison is 45 megajoules and lithium batteries are one megajoule. So they'll try to tell you that it's a hundred times better than uh, lithium and electricity. But the problem is you need a tank. And even if you're using the best material in the world, you need 10 kilograms of tank for every one kilogram of hydrogen. The motor efficiency is low, the motor weight is low. So really from electricity through hydrogen, you've only got about two or four megajoules per kilogram for the whole machinery you know, 50 times worse than what you are sold. Um, petrol and diesel also pays a big penalty for the engine and the tank and the gearboxes that are much more complicated than the electricity. So it's really only about four and a half and lith lithium batteries are again about one. So actually the advantage they sell you is not nearly what you think it is. So then the hydrogen people are gonna to try to sell you on the cost. And in Australia and the United States, the departments of energy have set the long-term target of $2 a kilogram uh, in Australia, uh, in Australian dollars or $1 a kilogram in US dollars for hydrogen. This on paper sounds like it's six cents per kilowatt hour, but you now have to remember that solar is generating at two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Solar with 24 hours, uh, seven days a week batteries is seven cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, natural gas is pretty cheap. Three coal is, is two and a half there. So they're not even competing well against those. But again, because of the compression, because of the tanks, because of the fuel cells, because those cost money, hydrogen will be 12 cents a kilowatt hour. That's if we can hit that one and two dollar a kilowatt hour target. And because the majority of the cost of making hydrogen is the energy that goes into making it, that's why everyone wants to make it with cheap hydroelectricity. So maybe to underscore what is the driving force behind this interest in hydrogen. Uh, the International Energy Agency is behind hydrogen. The international gas industry is by hydrogen. They are organizations that historically represented the gas and the oil industry, particularly in Europe. Another component of the hydrogen story is that part of the reason Germany and Japan failed in World War II is because they didn't have a domestic liquid fuel. So they didn't have diesel or gasoline to run their tanks and airplanes. So both countries invested in gasification of coal into some other fuel, including hydrogen as an idea uh, uh, to have a stronger uh, war fighting capacity um, the next time around. So both for historical reasons, there are very big industrial trading nations who would like hydrogen to be the future because they believe that would be a more secure fuel for them. And they have driven a lot of the global conversation and the interest in hydrogen. So um, I think, you know, to summarize, it's not a good idea. You know, let me step back for a second. The reason Fortescue Industries and others are now looking for hydroelectricity to generate hydrogen is because they need the cheapest possible electricity to hit that cost target of one or two dollars a kilogram they'll need electricity that costs about two cents a kilowatt hour 
The only electricity source in the world that we know that can do that is hydroelectricity. Um, but that's really only for historic hydro facilities. It's unlikely to happen on new built facilities. Um, and that's why the industries that are out to make hydrogen are out to try and buy long-term, low-cost contract electricity from hydro facilities to create their hydrogen. If they do that, that cheap hydroelectricity will not be available to local populations um, to solve their other energy needs, including transportation and, and getting to zero emissions electrically. Uh, so it is a very poor trade to give the cheapest and most reliable of our renewable energy sources, hydroelectricity, a way to create a fuel such as hydrogen, which isn't going to be the cheapest. And let me really emphasize this because as the top, as the as the you've noticed in the introductory video, the reason is not really to do this for the Congo to create this hydrogen. It is to create hydrogen gas for an export fuel, mostly to Europe, probably to Asia as well. Hydrogen creation in the Congo, hydrogen creation in Australia, where I am, will not solve any of your domestic emissions problems and will only increase the energy cost for your local people. It is a bad idea driven by a historically uh, bad idea and by a national security issue that is not yours. So on energetic grounds, on efficiency grounds, on national security grounds, on cost of living, uh, hydrogen from hydroelectricity is a terrible idea. Sorry, and I'll finish there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Saul Griffith. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, our next speaker this evening is Christine Milne. Christine uh, is a global leader on climate and biodiversity crisis that we're all facing. She's a former senator of Australia's parliament and leader of the Australian Greens. Before that, Christine was a member of parliament in the state of Tasmania. She's very active in uh, campaigns for the environment right now, mainly in Tasmania around restoring Lake Pedder, which was uh, something that is a terrible tragedy that happened here in Tasmania where they flooded Lake Pedder and it should never have happened. Um, on the board of many environmental organisations, including the Bob Brown Foundation. So please welcome uh, Christine Milne, our next speaker. Thank you, Jenny, and hello everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for this very important webinar. I am joining you from uh, Tasmania, which is uh, Aboriginal land, never ceded, the land of the Palawa people. And I pay my respect to their elders past and present. I am really excited to be able to talk to so many people about this hype that is around hydrogen at the moment. And I think uh, listening to Saul a moment ago, it's quite clear that it is not a climate solution. It is not the most efficient or useful uh, form of energy and it has huge destructive capacity in the natural environment. Why is, as, why is there this global hype, as Saul said? Yes, the International Energy Agency is behind it and the gas industry is behind it, but who is driving it? And that's what I want to address tonight. It was mentioned earlier, but I'd like to just go through it now. Ready for the sharing Yes, screen. please. So this hype around green hydrogen is being driven globally by, uh, by an Australian billionaire, and I'll get to him at the, in a minute. But he's basically out there challenging the corporate world, saying if you want to look your children in the face, then you need to get on board with green hydrogen. The Bob Brown Foundation were horrified by this idea because we know what it means in terms of the injustice for people around the world the biodiversity implications, the methane implications. And so we took out a full page advertisement, which you can see there in one of Australia's leading newspapers to basically point out that far from being a climate solution, it is a very bad idea and people need to actually see all of the pronouncements as hype. Thank you, Jen. The hype is being driven by Andrew Twiggy Forrest. He's one of Australia's richest men, net worth of uh, 27.25 billion at the moment. 
He owns the Fortescue Metals Group. It's the world's fourth largest iron ore miner, and it's also a major greenhouse gas emitter. Uh, more than 254 million megatons of CO2e in the fiscal year 2021. So thank you. Next. Fortescue Metals has established a subsidiary called Fortescue Future Industries. Now, the quote there is from their website. It's green energy technology and development company to lead the green industrial revolution, developing technology solutions for hard to decarbonize industries while building a global portfolio of renewable green hydrogen and green ammonia projects. That is essentially the hype. But it's important to realise that the way that they are funding Fortescue Future Industries is 10% of the profits from this major greenhouse gas emitter is, uh, is going from them into Fortescue Future Industries. So this uh, green technology company is being funded straight out of a mega mining company and a mega emitter. Thank you. Twiggy Forest is now intent on investing in every possible site he can worldwide for the generation of renewable energy and in everything else that he can, including the production of electrolyzers. He's going, he's investing in quantum computing. He's talking up green hydrogen everywhere in every possible field that he can. And he's announced he's building a, a huge manufacturing center in central Queensland in order to build these electrolyzers and cables and wind turbines. Thank you. He promotes himself as the green, great green warrior, the climate champion, the green savior at home in Australia, but also at every climate conference around the world. Thank you. Before the COP uh, in Glasgow, he set off to London and he painted a fleet of London taxis green in order to build the, the hype and the boost around green hydrogen, arguing that simply that it can save us, uh, waiting for it is no good, we have to get on with it straight away. And while he was at the COP, he did deals on the side, a memorandum of understanding with the Kingdom of Jordan, a deed of agreement with PNG to investigate in the feasibility of seven hydropower projects and 11 geothermal projects. He also signed a memorandum of understanding for the supply of hydrogen to Japan. Thank you. Since the COP or before around about the same time, he recruited Australia's former prime minister, Malcolm Turnbull, uh, to work with Fortescue Future Industries, but Malcolm is also a board member of the International Hydro Association. So that's a happy coincidence uh, that they, you've got someone on the board of the International Hydro Association now talking up uh, green hydrogen. Together, Twiggy and Malcolm have launched an international body uh, to promote the use of green hydrogen using renewables over other forms uh, of hydrogen. And they're basically saying, and they're right to say this, that blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen, uh, fossil fuel hydrogen, and they are bad. That is, that is the correct message. He also condemns carbon capture and storage, and that too is correct. But part of the rationale for doing that, of course, is to talk up green hydrogen as the saviour, as if it is green and has no greenhouse gas implications or any other negative implications compared with those other major polluters. Thank you. Now, to promote his, uh, his vision, um, Twiggy Forrest has in the past year met with uh, President Joe Biden, with the President of the European Commission, with the UK Prime Minister. He has uh, gone to over a dozen uh, non-binding commitments, including an agreement with Airbus to look at making planes powered by hydrogen. And he's also got a plan to send 5 million tonnes of green hydrogen to Germany by 2030, around 30% of what the country needs 
to replace its reliance on Russian energy. And that goes to the point that Saul made a moment ago about Germany and Japan. They are two of the countries that Twiggy Forest has targeted. Jenny. Now, while the world was locked down with COVID, uh, with a 50 person entourage and private jet, uh, Twiggy went to 47 countries to explain to explore these green hydrogen deals. 47 countries. Uh, so they they formed a base in Croatia, and from there they went all over the place, including the DRC, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, the Russian Far East, and Kenya. So that is why this hype is everywhere because he is driving it, and he is Australia's. Uh, billionaire, second richest man, and has the money and the capacity to just drive this everywhere he goes. Go on, Jenny, thank you. Now, he, he, um, he has signed up, as we have heard earlier, uh, a deal with the Congo, um, and he's basically talking up uh, these investments, not only in the Congo, but he visited Ethiopia as well, telling people that they can build their own Fortescues with their own populations, never acknowledging, of course, that the local people will never have access to the energy from the hydropower that he wants to generate. And of course, there are all sorts of other problems uh, with corruption and with uh, workers' rights as well. And the Grand Inga scheme is the one that was referred to earlier in the introductory uh, video. So uh, Mr. Forrest met the Congo president to discuss the project. And of course he says it would produce energy to, uh, hydro to export around the world, confirming what we all know it is for export to Europe, which is why it's really important that the European ENGOs start thinking about this pitch on green uh, hydrogen. Thank you. After that initial trip, uh, Twiggy then set off again uh, between April and June in 2021, and they went to Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, the United States, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, and on and on, <laughs> Cameroon, Namibia, you name it, and they were there. And when he came back, this is what he said, that Fortescue has secured the prime hydro sites across Africa to develop in excess of 100 gigawatts of power for green hydrogen product. He says he has firm interest for at least that amount in Europe, and we're continuing to build relationships across Africa, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. We're speaking to off-takers, governments, and energy source nations as we stitch together a global green hydrogen supply chain. So thank you, Jen. That's why we should be really concerned here about the fact that he is dealing straight with the leaders of these countries. There's no community consultation, and it's all about how much money he's prepared to invest and particular MOUs with the leaders. And of course, the corruption risks are great. Now, as you can see here, um, there's a photo of Twiggy on a horse in Afghanistan. He's in St. Petersburg. He's meeting the president of the Congo. Thank you. And this again uh, talks about the Congo development, which we've already discussed. Thank you, On. He is also uh, near to home uh, engaging with uh, Papua New Guinea. And as I mentioned earlier, his intention is to have seven hydro and 11 geothermal projects in uh, PNG. Now the river that he's talking about uh, one of the dams he's talking about there is the Purari River. It's, um, it's an absolutely beautiful river in uh, PNG. It flows into the Gulf of Papua. It's the third largest river in Papua New Guinea, 630 kilometers long. It's heavy tropical jungle and abundant uh, bird life. And of course, several villages along the river. Now, um, people, there would be at least, uh, 1,500 people displaced if they built this hydro dam, but not only that, of course, you're, de you're destroying their way of life and also the biodiversity of that area. 
So there's quite a lot of concern about what's going on in PNG. But again, the deals have been done with the government and the local people. Uh, they were asked back in 2010 about this when Origin Energy was going to build this dam, but they dropped it because they couldn't be sure that they would get offsets in the um, global offset market for building this and never forget that they're trying to sell this as a green project, as green hydrogen, in order to try to get as many subsidies from governments as they can, including offsets. Thanks, Jen. I think that's the end. Is that the end? No. Sorry. Okay, so um, uh, another place, of course, he's been <clears throat> is in South America, and again, it's a it's a wind project there rather than a uh, hydro project. Uh, but nevertheless, the question is how much local uh, consultation has been made. It's all about doing the deals with the presidents. Thank you, Jen. Next. So I want to come to what it means, the climate justice issues. First of all, if he gets the go ahead and goes on with the Grand Inga scheme in the Congo and in PNG, we will see the displacement of thousands of people, the exploitation of resources in Africa and Papua New Guinea, purely for export to the European market with no benefit for local people. There'll be shocking biodiversity impacts uh, from the loss of those wild rivers, the loss of tropical forests, the transmission corridors uh, through those uh, forests, and of course, mega methane emissions uh, from the dams themselves. The risk of corruption is very great, as is the exploitation of workers and communities. Now, Twiggy Forest has, again, with a lot of hype, signed up anti-slavery agreements around the world saying that he's very keen to make sure that uh, there is no trafficking of people and exploitation of people but actually at the same time his very own uh, index for corruption for slavery puts uh, the Congo, PNG and Afghanistan quite high up and the fact is you can't on the one hand say that you're concerned about trafficking and corruption in these countries and make a thing of announcing that globally and then at the next minute go and do deals with the leadership in government in those countries and expect that you can get away with doing both. That just simply is not going to wash. Our concern here is to make sure that uh, people recognise that green hydrogen generated from hydro dams built specifically for the purpose of generating energy to go into green hydrogen is inefficient and it offends the whole notion of climate justice and it's a biodiversity and climate crime. Thanks, Jen. And what we're now seeing, which is why it's so important we're doing this webinar tonight, is we have seen deals being signed up in the UK and in Europe. So um, JCB, for example, um, is a large company in the UK, in, in the UK, yes. And it will be, it's signed up to take um, hydrogen from uh, Twiggy Forest and also in Germany. We've seen uh, this agreement between German company and Fortescue Future Industries, and that has been welcomed uh, by German industry, including the uh, Green Members of Parliament there. So I really want to bring home to the UK government and to the Germans that if they're going to consider green hydrogen, they need to look at, first of all, whether it's actually green, whether it's efficiently uh, produced and where it's come from to do their due diligence. Because if it comes out of Africa or comes out of um, uh, PNG, then it is not green. So I think I will leave it there just to say thank you everyone and to watch out for this, watch the due diligence, watch this man uh, strut around the planet. And we have to say, take the hydro, the hydro out of hydrogen and that the UK and Europe must rule out purchasing green hydrogen from any new dam starting with Africa and Papua New Guinea. Thanks very much, Jen.
Thank you so much, Christine Milne. And uh, we're very thankful to have such great speakers tonight. Uh, our next speakers are going to be moving into talking about case examples. We have a case example from the Project for the Development of the Congo River. And our guest speakers are Eric Kasongo from CODED and Emmanuel Masu from CORAP. <laughs> Eric Kasongo has worked for years to protect the environment and defend human rights in the Democratic Republic of Congo and across Africa. He co-founded in 2008 the Congolese Centre for Sustainable Development Law based in Kinshasa and serves at its exec as its executive director. He was a member of the working group on extractive industries within the African Commission on Human and People's Rights from 2014 to 2020. He's a legal researcher for the Centre for International Sustainable Development Law to promote climate, to promote climate change mitigation and adaptation. Emmanuel Masu is an engineer in environment and sanitation management. He has developed an expertise in policy monitoring and advocacy, particularly in the water sector and on renewable energy. He cont contributed to the creation of several campaigns, among others on sustainable river management, and to fight against large energy infrastructure projects, including the case of the Grand Inga project in Democratic Republic of Congo. Currently, he plays the role of Executive Secretary of the Coalition of Civil Society Organisations for the Monitoring of Reforms and Public Action, CORAP. We're very, very thankful to have you both here tonight. Merci beaucoup. Euh, malheureusement, je ne sais pas si c'est un problème euh, à partir euh, de l'administrateur. Ma caméra ne s'allume pas. Mais néanmoins, euh, voilà, je suis Emmanuel Moussouyou. Je, comme, comme il a été dit, je travaille pour CORAP où je suis secrétaire exécutif. Et donc, euh, nous avons le plaisir de participer à cette activité, cette importante activité qui parle de l'hydrogène. Aujourd'hui, tout le monde à travers le, euh, le monde, bien évidemment, parle de l'hydrogène et nous avons le plaisir justement de partager l'expérience de la RDC en ce qui concerne euh, l'hydrogène et surtout le, le projet de FFI. Alors, rapidement, euh, notre sommaire, il va aborder plusieurs aspects, mais on va euh, faire l'effort pour rester bref. On peut aller sur euh, le premier slide qui... Euh, qui euh, parle du projet INGA. Je pense qu'il est important pour nous d'avoir une brève description du projet INGA. Je pense que vous avez déjà entendu parler de, de INGA. Quand on parle de grand INGA, c'est en fait un projet qui euh, était censé être développé en phase. Selon le pays, euh, nous avons un grand potentiel sur le fleuve Congo qui pourra euh, aider à produire jusqu'à à plus ou moins 45 000 mégawatts euh, sur le site d'INGA à lui seul parce que la RDC, dans sa globalité, a un potentiel de plus de 100 000 mégawatts. Donc, le site d'Inga lui seul a la possibilité d'aller jusqu'à 45, entre 45 et 50 000 mégawatts. Et donc, parce qu'il euh, était, il était pensé que le, développer le projet Grand Inga euh, coûterait beaucoup d'argent, parce que le Grand Inga lui-même, il pourra mobiliser jusqu'à plus de 100 millions, de milliards de, de dollars. Donc, c'est comme ça que le projet a été échelonné en phase. On peut aller sur le slide suivant, s'il vous plaît. Donc, il a été échelonné en phase et l'idée du départ était de commencer par la construction du barrage Inga 3 parce que Inga 1 et 2 existent et en phase, on va aller jusqu'à Inga 8. Et donc, euh, parlant de Inga 3, il y a eu beaucoup d'évolutions. S'il vous plaît, we can move with the slide. Donc, il y a, il y a beaucoup d'évolutions. On peut aller sur le, le suivant. Il y a beaucoup d'évolutions en ce qui concerne le projet INGA. Déjà ici, en quelques mots, on peut parler de, de ce qu'il y a eu euh, lorsque euh, la Banque africaine de développement est venue appuyer la RDC pour, euh, n'est-ce pas, mener des études euh, de préfaisabilité pour euh, le développement du site d'INGA. Ça a été appelé études de développement du site d'INGA et des, et des interconnexions électriques associées. Et donc, la BAD, avec sa vision, est venue à travers ses études euh, identifier le potentiel pour commencer à produire euh, euh, déjà la première phase du projet INGA qui s'appelait à l'époque INGA 3 basse chute avec euh, la possibilité de produire jusqu'à 4800 MW. Slide suivant, s'il vous plaît. Et donc, 
Euh, après, euh, beaucoup d'évolutions, beaucoup de discussions qui ont été faites. Euh, du coup, euh, il y avait un processus pour sélectionner les développeurs qui devaient, euh, n'est-ce pas, euh, développer le projet INGA. Et parmi tant d'autres, il y avait beaucoup de candidats, entre autres les Espagnols, les Chinois et bien d'autres candidats. Mais vous serez surpris, euh, parmi les développeurs qui étaient, n'est-ce pas, euh, sélectionné en 2018 à l'époque à travers un contrat qui était signé appelé « Accord pour le développement exclusif ». On a vu le gouvernement congolais inviter les Espagnols et les Chinois se mettre ensemble. À l'époque, le président Kabila avait effectué une visite en Chine où il a vu les prouesses de la Chine et il a eu quelques accords avec, avec ces derniers. Et donc, s'il faut comparer parmi les, les, les offres qui étaient présentées, l'offre de la Chine était l'offre la moins qualifiée, la moins cotée. Mais parce qu'il y avait de l'intérêt de fonctionner avec les Chinois, c'est comme ça que le gouvernement congolais était obligé de voir l'Espagne qui devait gagner le projet. Euh, il les avait obligés justement de se mettre ensemble avec la Chine pour constituer le groupement sino-espagnol pour produire Inga. Et cette fois-là, dans leur vision, ils ont dit d'aller plutôt à 11 000 mégawatts. Et finalement, aujourd'hui, nous sommes en train de parler de Fortescue euh, Metal Group à travers sa succursale Fortescue Future Industries. Avec sa vision, lui, par contre, vient pour dire qu'il est capable d'exploiter de, le fleuve Congo dans son intégralité. Et exploiter le fleuve Congo, c'est produire tout son, tout son potentiel jusqu'à couvrir le 45 000 MW, plus ou moins. Et donc, Fortescue, dans sa vision, il vient en RDC pour construire des usines euh, de sorte à lui permettre à transformer des matières premières et principalement, ils sont là pour produire de l'hydrogène comme le prédécesseur était en train de dire. Donc, ils ont dans leur plan planifié aller euh, mettre ces usines dans une de nos provinces, dans une ville côtière au bord de, de l'océan qui s'appelle la, la, la ville de Mwanda. Et donc, la stratégie, c'est que toute l'énergie qu'ils devront produire, parce que dans leur plan euh, qu'ils appellent projet de développement du, du fleuve Congo, c'est que euh, ils ont besoin de plus de 75 000 MW, alors que le site d'Inga ne pourra pas donner jusqu'à 75 000. Ils ont identifié d'autres sites, notamment le site de Matadi et d'Empioca, qui pourra euh, justement compléter de sorte à aboutir à obtenir ce qu'ils qu veulent. Et l'ensemble de toute cette énergie, selon Fortescue, devra être orientée vers les industries qu'ils vont construire à Mwanda. Pourquoi Mwanda parce que sur le plan stratégique, Mwanda, euh, c'est au bord de l'océan. Tout ce qu'ils peuvent produire, notamment l'hydrogène et les autres intrants, euh, ils vont facilement les exporter vers le marché occidental. Donc, c'est ça le plan. Et dans leur, euh, euh, dans l'accord qu'ils ont signé avec le gouvernement congolais jusque-là, le préaccord, il n'y a aucun mégawatt qui est prévu pour la population congolaise. Donc, l'ensemble de tout ce qu'ils feront ira, euh, ira dans les pays étrangers. Donc, des trois euh, illustrations, j'ai parlé de la, de, de la banque, la Banque africaine de développement, j'ai parlé des développeurs euh, du groupe Massino-Espagnol qui sont venus avec une vision, j'ai parlé des Fortescue Metal Group qui est aussi venu avec une vision, slide suivant. Et donc, des trois, vous allez vous rendre compte que le gouvernement congolais se permet de subir les, les pressions ou les visions des développeurs. Parce que chacun qui veut développer Inga, qui a ce moyen, vient convaincre le gouvernement congolais pour suivre ce que lui, il propose. Et la grande question que nous nous posons par rapport à ça, quelle est finalement la vision de la RDC pour le développement du projet Inga Donc, vous allez vous rendre compte que la RDC n'a pas une vision claire pour l'exploitation de son secteur de l'énergie, pour l'exploitation de ses plus grandes ressources. Et donc, cela fait en sorte que euh, tout celui qui a de moyens, qui arrive pourra, n'est-ce pas, euh, convaincre le gouvernement. Et très rapidement, euh, en ce qui concerne euh, FFI, notamment parce qu'on parlait de FFI, dans sa stratégie, il veut devenir champion des énergies vertes. Je pense que mes prédécesseurs en ont parlé. Ils veulent démontrer au monde qu'ils sont prêts justement à produire de l'hydrogène vert. Ils sont fiers de, de le dire. Ils sont, euh, n'est-ce pas, euh, fiers de dire qu'ils veulent, n'est-ce pas, assurer que son équipe des techniciens serait en train de travailler aussi bien sur des aspects sociaux et autres. Ils veulent affirmer que euh, FFI s'assurera euh, de, 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 du bien-être des communautés et, et autres. Mais finalement, si on suit bien, 
Euh, au fond, si on produit de l'hydrogène vert, la grande question, c'est quels sont les impacts qui sont créés au lieu de, de, de production. À Inga, il y aura plus de 35 000 communautés, euh, d'ailleurs c'est un chiffre minoré, qui seront déplacées. Il y a beaucoup d'impact sur euh, les, les, les écosystèmes. Euh, le fleuve sera modifié complètement. Aujourd'hui, déjà, des pêcheurs n'ont plus presque de vie, n'ont plus de moyens, de substances à cause des impacts. Donc, au fond, ils veulent se présenter comme champions de l'énergie verte et des bonnes pratiques, mais en réalité, ils violent des lois du pays, ils violent les droits des communautés locales et bien d'autres. Euh, et finalement, donc, il, y a, il y a toute la question liée au, euh, à, au, à l'accord qui a été signé. Donc, trois choses qu'on peut retenir de l'accord qui a été signé avec la RDC, c'est que tout d'abord, c'est un accord qui a été signé en violation des lois de la RDC en ce qui concerne la passation de marché public. Cet accord viole justement ces règles parce qu'il y, y a plutôt des intérêts de certains individus proches du président de la République qui ont motivé que l'accord soit signé. Deuxième chose, c'est que cet accord vient exploiter les communautés. J'ai bien aimé la présentation précédente où on démontre que, dans la, en ce qui concerne la justice climatique, il y a, n'est-ce pas, la problématique d'exploitation des communautés. Aujourd'hui, FFI se déploie sur le site d'Inga. Tout le, tout le mois ou tout le temps, ils sont là-bas en contact avec les communautés. Ils leur donnent de cadeaux, ils leur donnent des fausses informations pour attirer leur attention et avoir leur adhésion. Ça, c'est une façon d'exploiter les communautés parce qu'au fond, ils n'auront pas de bons bénéfices au fait à tirer de ça. Et finalement, la troisième des choses mauvaises à tirer de cet accord, c'est le fait qu'ils vont prendre le plus grand potentiel énergétique de la RDC. J'étais en train de dire au début que la RDC a un potentiel de plus de 100 000 mégawatts, plus ou moins 110 000 mégawatts, mais FFI compte exploiter près de 75 000 mégawatts de façon directe. C'est le plus grand potentiel hydroélectrique de la RDC. Et de ces plus grands potentiels, ils n'ont prévu aucun mégawatt pour la population congolaise. Donc, ils visent plutôt le marché extérieur, ce qui se présente comme mauvaise chose. Et peut-être pour finir, euh, comme je le disais, donc, nous sommes des organisations de la société civile autour de la coalition Tobo Imolili. C'est au fait des acteurs qui ont commencé à travailler depuis plusieurs années, près de 2013 ou même bien avant. Et il y a eu beaucoup de campagnes qu'on a engagées pour, n'est-ce pas, lutter contre le développement de ce projet qui ne prend pas en considération le droit des communautés locales, les droits des populations congolaises, qui risque d en, d en, de, de pousser, d'enfoncer la RDC dans une dette qu'on ne pourra pas payer parce qu'on parle de plus, de plus ou moins 14 à 20 milliards de dollars. Donc, c'est énorme. Et justement, euh, cela nous a conduit à des bons résultats, à des grands résultats qu'on peut noter ici, c'est que le projet, c'est depuis 2013 qu'on en parle et jusqu'à aujourd'hui, en 2022, il n'y a aucun accord euh, sérieux qui a été signé. Je pense qu'une des choses qui est à la base, c'est aussi cet, euh, cet engagement de la société civile et des communautés locales. Donc, euh, je préfère justement m'arrêter euh, là-bas pour donner euh, la chance à mon collègue, Maître Eric, de continuer pour parler des, des impacts sur les communautés et des bien d'autres aspects. Merci. Maître Eric Oui, euh, merci beaucoup. Euh, merci euh, euh, International Rivers. Euh, merci aussi euh, à tous ceux qui se sont joints à cet appel pour euh, 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 aborder cette question de l'hydrogène vert. C'est une quand même une première euh, en République démocratique du Congo. Euh, même si à suivre la, la présentation de, de, de Christine. Euh, qui est très riche euh, en informations par rapport euh, au déploiement au niveau international de Andrew Forest pour pouvoir euh, vendre cette idée de, euh, de, de la commercialisation de l'hydrogène vert comme une solution euh, au, au changement climatique, euh, nous a conforté justement dans les inquiétudes que nous avions par rapport à, à cette manne qui a été présentée au gouvernement congolais comme euh, étant une solution qui pourrait amener euh, justement le gouvernement congolais à s'enrichir euh, plus que comparé aux anciens formats présentés par les Chinois euh, et, et les Espagnols. Alors, euh, moi, j'aimerais insister sur, sur les aspects relatifs justement aux impacts 
par rapport à ces nouveaux formats euh, dont mon collègue Emmanuel venait de parler tout à l'heure, parce qu'effectivement, le format actuel qui est en cours de validation et qui est fondé sur le MOU euh, signé en 2020, en septembre, avec le gouvernement congolais, est celui qui consiste à dire que l'énergie d'Inga euh, n'a pas besoin d'être vendue à l'étranger, n'a pas besoin d'être développée pour être commercialisée comme les Chinois et les Espagnols le proposaient. Mais la solution miracle de M. Andrew Forrest, c'est que l'énergie Inga puisse être transformée localement et puisse être euh, utilisée pour la production de l'hydrogène vert, vendu comme solution euh, euh, au changement climatique et euh, être commercialisé euh, à l'étranger. Une fois que c'est commercialisé à l'étranger, le gouvernement congolais ne peut espérer que sur le, le retour euh, sur l'investissement après que tous ceux qui ont déjà signé les contrats euh, d'achat de l'hydrogène vert comme euh, Madame Christine venait de, de les mentionner, euh, le Japon, les États-Unis ou encore euh, euh, la Grande-Bretagne auront payé pour, pour participer. Donc, c'est là toute la question un peu qui, euh, qui fonde euh, les, les raisons de, cette, euh, de ces webinaires. Alors, au niveau interne, au niveau de la RDC, il y a la question des impacts de ce, de ce qui va être produit. Parce que, contrairement à ce que nous avions avant, le nouveau projet d'aménagement du Congo va comporter non seulement les grands Inga, mais aussi il y aura des barrages tels que Mpioka et Matadi, ainsi de suite. Ensuite, il va y avoir beaucoup d'autres infrastructures qui vont être construites. Il va y avoir des pipelines, euh, il va y avoir des lignes électriques, il va y avoir même des euh, de, de ports qui vont être construits pour euh, justement l'acheminement de, euh, de l'hydrogène qui sera, qui, sera, qui sera produit vers l'étranger. Nous, nous sommes posés des questions par rapport, si nous étions inquiets par rapport à, aux communautés qui pouvaient être impactées à Inga, on estime aujourd'hui, comme mon collègue l'a dit, à plus de 35 000 ou 37 000 âmes, euh, les chiffres étant corrigés. Vous avez d'autres communautés qui se sont ajoutées, qui sont tout autour euh, de tous les territoires de, de Sekebanza, qui sont autour de Matadi, qui sont autour de Tioka, euh, pour lesquels, jusqu'à aujourd'hui, les, les, les impacts qui pourront être les leurs par rapport au scénario technique qui va être appliqué par, par FFI, euh, n'est pas encore connu. Et donc, c'est des, des grandes questions euh, pour lesquelles nous nous préoccupons aussi au, au niveau de la coalition Toboï Moulini, à savoir qu'un tel projet euh, aussi ambitieux et avec des impacts aussi grands qui dépassent de très loin simplement les communautés d'Inga puissent être gardés euh, dans l'opacité euh, au niveau des études qui sont, qui sont menées. Euh, les FFI, dans sa stratégie de communication, a justement affirmé qu'il y a des études qui sont faites, mais aucune de ces études, je rappelle que les études qui vont être faites, euh, pour revenir un peu sur ce qu'Emmanuel avait dit, pour Inga, il y avait les études de faisabilité pour Inga 3. On n'a jamais fait les études de faisabilité pour Inga 4, 5, 6 ou 7 et 8. Maintenant, euh, ces packages qui constituent les grands Inga, à ces packages, il faut ajouter Matadi et Mpioka, qui eux aussi sont à part, qui ont besoin aussi des études spécifiques. Donc, je vous laisse euh, imaginer le nombre d'études qu'il y a à produire et euh, la façon dont ils doivent les restituer, justement, pour comprendre, pour comprendre si euh, les impacts qui, qui vont poser ce projet ne seront pas. Donc, les jours à venir vont nous poser. Un autre problème, c'est le problème euh, plus bon technique au niveau de, de l'influence que ces barrages-là, parce que ça quand même... Euh, Plusieurs barrages qui vont être construits vont avoir sur les débits du fleuve Congo. Déjà, en temps normal, avec les deux barrages qui sont là, Inga 1 et 2, nous assistons à des moments où euh, les niveaux des, du fleuve baissent considérablement. Ce sont des, des périodes saisonnières qui sont liées au climat de la RDC. Maintenant, avec les nouveaux barrages qui, sont, qui vont venir, beaucoup de spécialistes estiment qu'il va y avoir certainement des, des impacts ou des influences négatives sur les débuts du fleuve Congo, et donc influer sur déjà l'énergie qui, qui, qui est produite par Inga 1 et 2, qui, je le rappelle, n'est produit pas assez déjà à, sa, à 100% de ses capacités. Alors que, euh, de façon générale, le pays euh, en tant que tel a encore besoin, euh, pour sa desserte, pour s'améliorer, de plusieurs... Euh, d'améliorer de, 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 justement sa desserte en énergie. 
parce que le pourcentage des Congolais qui, qui ont accès à l'électricité aujourd'hui est très faible. Et la Banque mondiale a, dans un rapport de 2020, décrit la situation qui, qui est chaotique. C'est que si rien n'est fait jusqu'à présent, 80 millions de personnes, soit à environ 80% de la population totale de la RDC d'ici en 2030, seront toujours dans la précarité énergétique. Et les, ce qui est surprenant, c'est qu'avec tous les potentiels que, que les pays ont, les solutions qui sont privilégiées, c'est seulement les solutions euh, qui promeuvent les grandes centrales hydroélectriques, alors qu'on peut mettre en avant des solutions avantageuses telles que la, la, la promotion des énergies renouvelables dont nous avons euh, un grand potentiel au, 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 au niveau du pays. Et euh, toujours dans ces rapports, la Banque mondiale a estimé que l'énergie solaire au réseau offre plusieurs solutions modulaires pour accroître rapidement l'accès à moindre coût à l'énergie. Et que le gouvernement peut tirer parti d'une montée en puissance significative du secteur en améliorant l'environnement économique et en fournissant un financement abordable. Encore davantage que le besoin en investissement du secteur dépasse largement la capacité budgétaire du gouvernement actuel et, et, et des efforts importants pour attirer les capitaux des opérateurs. Donc, on est dans une situation où euh, le secteur de l'énergie offre beaucoup de potentiel sur le développement des énergies euh, propres, mais le gouvernement a tendance non seulement à affecter moins des de capitaux sur euh, l'amélioration du secteur de l'énergie, mais lorsqu'il est question d'utiliser ces potentiels-là, on, on est euh, prêt à gober des sources, des visions qui viennent de l'étranger. Sur l'hydrogène vert particulièrement, et peut-être que je vais commencer à acheter par là, il faut que nous retenions une chose, c'est que comme Emmanuel l'avait dit tout à l'heure, la RDC n'a aucune vision propre euh, sur euh, les développements de, cette, euh, de cet hydrogène et même les développements de son potentiel. Parce qu'il n'y a qu'à suivre l'historique de tout ce qu'il y a eu comme développeur de projets qui sont passés à différents régimes. Vous allez constater que chaque investisseur qui vient à une période donnée vient avec une vision. Et automatiquement, le gouvernement, les autorités acceptent. Donc, il y a un problème aussi de développement de cette vision, de ce que, comment on veut planifier le développement de ces potentiels qui existent pour éviter d'avaler des sources comme euh, celles qu'apporte Fortescue Future Industry, qui parle de euh, euh, produire in situ euh, de l'énergie les transformer en, en hydrogène et puis, euh, et, puis, et puis les commercialiser pour que le gouvernement puisse gagner après. Après, vous avez les conditions dans lesquelles ces, ces, ces MOU ont été signés. Pour ceux qui l'ont déjà parcouru, vous allez voir qu'il y a des clauses inacceptables euh, pour un gouvernement, pour un État souverain, que d'accepter des clauses pareilles euh, avec euh, une entité privée qui empêche même à ce que le le, le, le gouvernement puisse s'exprimer ou dévoiler les contenus de ce qu'il a signé. On parle d'un projet de plus de 80 milliards de dollars et même que le montant n'est pas total. Et donc là, c est, c est, ce sont des problèmes institutionnels qui se posent même par rapport à la vision qu'on apporte euh, dans ce projet. Mais d'un point de vue institutionnel, le pays a fait des pas. Nous avons eu euh, l'Atlas sur les énergies renouvelables qui donne... Euh, euh, une ossature de, de tout ce que le pays a comme potentiel qu'il peut développer. Nous avons eu récemment la mise en place d'une autorité de régulation, d'une agence pour l'électrification rurale. Eh bien, toutes ces agences-là et toutes ces initiatives-là souffrent d'un problème de financement important et de structuration interne pour pouvoir adresser la question et aller à l'essentiel. Et pour nous, l'essentiel, c'est quoi C'est donner plus d'énergie aux populations congolaises qui, je le rappelle, sont encore à moins de 10% d'accès. Mais la présence de toutes ces institutions-là ne permet toujours pas à la RDC de pouvoir faire face justement à ce qu'il a comme problème et de réaliser les progrès qu'ils doivent réaliser. Les, les efforts qui sont faits jusqu'à présent pour permettre à la RDC d'évoluer sont très, très maigres. C'est comme ça que, pour nous, au niveau de la coalition, nous avons estimé que c'était important que euh, des alliances soient ici au niveau international pour permettre à ce que la coalition Tobo Molili, dans sa lutte pour exiger une gouvernance exemplaire, exiger aussi de la transparence dans ce qu'il fait, c'est dénoncer tout ce qui est présenté comme fausse solution au changement climatique, 
puisse avoir de l'écho au niveau international et justement et permettre à ce que euh, on ne vienne pas nous vendre des sauces qui peuvent être euh, scientifiquement biaisées, c'est-à-dire que soutenues par une certaine euh, euh, classe de des de, de scientifiques qui les font de façon intéressée, alors que d'autres études scientifiques peuvent démontrer que justement euh, ces solutions-là ne sont pas de vraies solutions au, au changement climatique. Voilà ce que je peux dire. Euh, le temps nous est compté. Euh, brièvement pour compléter euh, cet exemple de, de la RDC qui euh, fait un saut vers l'inconnu avec cette ambition euh, qu'il embrasse de produire l'hydrogène vert avec Fortescue Future Industry. Merci beaucoup. Voilà, sinon, merci beaucoup. Nous ah, sommes thank à la you fin de so notre very, very much, Eric Kasongo and Emmanuel Masu. So important to have your story and your voice here tonight on this uh, webinar. It was critical that the stories out of Democratic Republic of Congo was essential to be sharing with people tonight. So thank you both so very much for speaking. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Daniel Ribeiro from Justice Ambiental. Uh, now, Daniel has been an activist for over 22 years since he was a teenager. He has a deep rooted sense of justice. And in 1998, Daniel, along with other citizens, formed a grassroots movement, movement to oppose a Danish funded toxic waste incinerator project that was planned in their neighborhood in Mozambique. They were eventually successful in stopping the incinerator. Through this process, Daniel was instrumental in founding of in the founding of Liveningo, Mozambique's first environmental justice organization. In 2004, he was also instrumental in the creation of Justi Justicia Ambiental. I'll let you say that better than me, Daniel, meaning environmental justice in Portuguese. Daniel continues to be central to that organization where he is currently the technical and research officer. And it's one of the most leading civil society nonprofit organizations in Mozambique. But please welcome Daniel and over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll be speaking about one of our longest campaigns, which is over 20 years old, and that's the campaign against the Pandankua Dam, which is a proposed dam on the Zimbizi River um, in Tet province. Uh, Tet province, if you look at the map, is that little piece of Mozambique that goes in between Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And it's 70 kilometers downstream of one of the largest dams in Africa, Horabasa. Um, just a quick history on the, on the project. Um, the, the, the project actually was first considered by the Portuguese during the colonial period while building the Horabasa Dam. Um, but then it was picked up again by Mozambique government um, in 1996 when they did a feasibility study. And since then, they've been trying to get it funded. Um, they had an investor conference with the World Bank, um, European Union, Invest European Bank, and Bank of Investment, and other um, investors interested in the project. But it failed that time to deal with a lot of the social and environmental impacts and the re reputational harm it would do in funding such a damaging dam um, for these institutions, and it was dropped. And of course, Again, in 2006, uh, it went, the government tried again, and this time with, uh, with the Chinese investment. Um, and it's been waves and waves of um, attempts and have been failing. But the last sets of failures hasn't been because of, of the environmental and social um, impact, because um, some of these investors they're looking for don't have these standards. Uh, but the main um, obstacle has been actually um, the market. Um, uh, Southern Africa, um, the main um, um, option and, and consumer of the, the electricity is South Africa. Um, the infrastructure in Southern Africa is controlled uh, mainly by a power utility called ESCOM. Um, they have a monopoly. So any project or energy produ production project is kind of dependent on using this infrastructure and um, therefore depends a lot on a power purchase agreement uh, with ESCOM and uh, depends a lot on South African, the South African market. 
And this has been a, a stumbling barrier because the ESCOM and the South African market has been very hesitant to make long-term contracts, which makes it very difficult, has been very difficult to um, get investors to go ahead with the with the fund and core dam um, because of its, um, the, the insecurity or the lack of, of um, guarantees on pricings for the life cycle of the project. So it's been it's been failing, and we've been fighting a lot of these attempts and highlighting a lot of these um, issues. Um, so, so that has been one of the most more successful strategies we've been doing to try and prevent this project. This project that has a huge social and environmental impact, but we're using a lot of the economics around it as a big tool to highlight these risks. Um, just to highlight how complicated the situation is, um, Mozambique. Um, biggest um, energy producer, which is the Corobasa Dam, until 2007 was selling the electricity to ESCOM at seven cents a kilowatt hour and buying it back at 15.7 uh, cents a kilowatt hour in the south because it was produced in central Mozambique, but the capital in the south of Mozambique needed electricity and we don't have our own infrastructure to transport our electricity. So we are buying it back at seven times the price we were selling it to ESCOM. And that's kind of nature of the of the um, electric city markets. It's, it's now been, the price has been renegotiated, but still it's better, but far from a just price. Um, so that's been the, one of the major barriers um, uh, for uh, the Pandaku Dam to go ahead. So what's been interesting now, this latest attempt, which in 2018, 19, the government again, tried to make this get investment, but this time there's an added component to the project, and that has been green hydrogen. So the, the green hydrogen has come in as a way and, and, and of um, getting way or, or trying to uh, get around some of these market options. Um, and it's made it's making this project far more economically feasible and has diversified um, the options in terms of getting investment. Um, so now, um, Let's not forget that the first few attempts that of this dam was due to the environmental and social impacts. Uh, it has huge impacts um, and also risks. It's it's going to be built uh, less than a kilometer away from an active fault line in which um, one of the top South African experts has raised major concerns on building a dam that's rated below um, the seismic um, activity for the area. Um, and some other really devastating, but we're not gonna go into that detail. But what we've noticed, what's really interesting is that not only is this uh, making it um, more economically feasible to get funding for such a damaging dam, but there's also a lot of links with the fossil industry because um, any, um, and the gas sector also is using hydrogen as a way to deal with the stranded assets of the gas sector. Uh, Mozambique is investing heavily in gas, but as we know, um, starting in gas when a lot of people trying to move away from gas has risks and that has caused some financial um, concerns which they've answered by doing hydrogen but it's dirty hydrogen and so and any also has a huge project in Algeria to produce hydrogen from clean energy and what we've noticed is they're using the green hydrogen as the driver to get Europe and other um, countries to invest in hydrogen infrastructure because a huge bottleneck that's been a big bottleneck has been the hydrogen infrastructure to end the transport so they're using the green hydrogen as the as a poster child to the to the hydrogen movement and trying to get europe to invest more in hydrogen in its infrastructure in its um and through the back door the dirty hydrogen will come in and you see that with any and the and you see a lot of the lobbying even though the dam industry is involved a lot of the money for the lobbying has been coming from the fossil fuel industry. Uh, for example, um, I, I think uh, uh, two years ago, if you look at the lobby investment, 58.6 million euros was invested um, by the hydrogen lobby um, to influence Brussels and the EU. Um, and if you look at the amount of meetings, there were four times more meetings uh, with high ranked commissioners than all NGO meetings on energy. And so that it's a big push. And when they talk about it, they talk a lot about the green hydrogen, even though it's a small percentage, as we mentioned before, in Europe, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny fraction of it. Um, but if 
but if the but if the green hydrogen can create the investment and create the narrative and therefore the infrastructure um, that opens the door for a lot of things and you see the same any is in mozambique any is invested in the gas up north um, but also it's helping with the the narratives around hydrogen as the safe uh, uh, fallback safety for the risks of fan acid gas but also um, supporting the idea of Mampandankua and the hydrogen and using that as a hyd hydrogen project. Um, and then you also see that in Algeria where the, they're pushing for a green um, a wind and solar um, hydrogen project. But if, if you look at the percentage, they also have huge coal reserves and also they're exploring potential of converting that into um, dirty hydrogen. Uh, so again, it's, a, it's always a smaller percentage, but it's the one that is being used to justify the that false green path to, um, and so that's another concern we're having is that link between the green hydrogen and being the, the poster child for actually the bulk, which is more de devastating. And it's making, making feasible a project that has numerous social and environmental issues and that has, um, and has been, really difficult for, to, to be funded suddenly becomes more feasible and uh, makes it um, more likely reality. Uh, so even though we have set seven minutes and I've really kind of come close, I can discuss in more detail about some of these issues in the questions and answers sections. Uh, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, and so grateful to have you also this evening with us, Daniel Ribeiro. And uh, we are going a little bit over the set time that we set for this evening. So please do bear with us. We um, did plan to finish at 7.30, but we still have a fantastic next speaker. And after our next speaker, we will have a question and answer time. Um, and we've already got some questions which I'm able to put to the speakers. So thanks to audience members for putting them through to us. Um, our next speaker is Pablo Brait. Pablo has been volunteering and working on climate and fossil fuel and renewable energy campaigns for the last 15 years. As a campaigner with the organisation Market Forces, he is working to convince the finance sector to end its support for coal, oil and gas com companies, with particular focus on insurance companies and the Stop Adani campaign. So please welcome Pablo. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny and, and everyone. Um, I'm speaking to you from Wurundjeri land um, in Melbourne, Australia, and want to acknowledge that this land was um, never ceded. Um, yeah, so as Jenny mentioned, I work at Market Forces. Um, we're an organisation that is really focused on uh, shifting finance away from projects that are destroying the environment and the climate. Um, and so we focus on banks, we focus on investors, uh, we focus on insurance companies and, you know, the companies linked to those, to those sectors. Um, I am, I'm here to give just a very quick story um, of a campaign against really a, a chain of mega projects uh, here in Australia, based around the Galilee Basin um, in central Queensland, I guess just to trigger some ideas possibilities. Um, so really, it's the how rather than, you know, the why, which has been so strongly uh, presented um, by the other speakers. Um, so the Galilee Basin um, is, there's been campaigning running on that now for around, uh, for a bit over a decade. Um, it is still going. Um, essentially, this, you know, around 12, 13 years ago, there was a, a surge of interest in mining thermal coal in the Galilee Basin. Um, there was the purchase of several mining leases by mainly Australian, uh, Indian and Chinese interests. And so there were eight or so mine projects plus associated railway lines and port expansions on the coast. Um, all the coal was for export. Um, just to give you a sense, if all these mines go ahead and are producing at the level that the companies, you know, said they wanted to produce at, that coal in the Galilee Basin represents around 6% of humanity's entire carbon budget for 1.5 degrees, just in one coal basin um, development. So really, the climate movement in Australia um, 
drew a line in the sand that this basin was not acceptable to be developed. It was not in line with a safe climate future in any way. So fast forward to 2022, um, only one of the mines has only just started to operate. It's the one um, being constructed and now operated by the Adani Group, um, an Indian-based conglomerate. Um, it's eight years delayed. It's one sixth of its um, initial proposed size and the railway line linking it to the port is also a much smaller capacity. Um, none of the other projects have progressed. Several of them seem completely dead and none of the several proposed port expansions um, have progressed as well. So, you know, while we can't say we've stopped every project, although we still intend to stop the Adani Carmichael mine, um, you know, it's had quite an impact. So the main wins have come via a campaign called Stop Adani, which was launched in 2017 when it became obvious that the Adani Carmichael project was the one that was advancing. Um, and I was really, the, you know, one part of the campaign has been focused on the finance sector. So we currently have 112 major companies that have made a public commitment not to have anything to do with this project. And it's mainly, that figure is mainly made up of banks and insurance companies. Um, and so the finance part of the campaign ran parallel to, you know, a focus on government approvals, then there were obviously legal challenges um, and a whole range of activities. So really what it was based on that no matter how big a company is, it needs lenders, it needs insurance, and it needs investors. And so we really just looked at this project and tried to track um, which were the companies already linked to the project and which were the companies that may be approached um, to work on this project. And so we initially started with um, lenders and, and the, the Adani Carmichael project was forced to self-fund. So it wasn't able to find a single private bank to loan it money um, and it had to use internal intercompany loans um, from other parts of the Adani group to build. Um, it's currently having some trouble, we believe, with insurance. Um, it's it's it was it wasn't able to find insurance through the mainstream insurers. It then went to the Lloyd's of London market, um, and we believe it's now had to find alternative and probably very expensive arrangements. And so, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I guess I wanted to flag the the key thing that we did to really start to get these companies to make the public commitments. And that was doing a lot of work to educate the finance sector on just how bad these developments and in particular the Adani mine was. And to really highlight the, for example, because initially a lot of the projects were port expansions on they all all of them literally in the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. And so that became a really key focus of the campaign. Um, and also just spending a lot of time um, getting across just how destructive the project was, that it had global implications, um, making sure that frontline voices of those impacted were highlighted and supported as much as possible. And, you know, here it was um, a group of traditional owners, um, you know, where the mine is being constructed, who have been fighting nonstop um, to have this project shelved. And just really repeating that over and over and over um, again. Um, and just having as wide a spectrum as possible of the companies that you're engaging with and providing this information to. And really one of the things that really helped us was building partnerships with people in the countries, you know, say we wanted to get Deutsche Bank to commit not to fund this project, then we would work with groups in Germany. Um, we would send, you know, we would go to visit maybe or the traditional owners would go and visit and have the local people um, organize the meetings and, and provide um, the local knowledge. Um, 
So look, I will stop there, uh, but yeah, if anyone's interested, yeah, have a look at the Stop Adani campaign um, and happy to answer any questions on that. Thanks. Fabulous, thank you, Pablo. And it's always great to get a story about successful campaigns against monolith projects and, and how they can cross international borders. So now we're going to move into questions for the speakers. I have some to get us started. So um, maybe uh, firstly, one for you, Christine, is um, given cost and inefficiency of using hydro hydrogen for electricity, do you anticipate it will be primarily used for other industrial purposes, example by refinery, steel plants, shipping and agriculture? And to what extent are those involved in the hydrogen industry being honest about its likely uses? Thank you. Yes, that's a really good question. Look, I think there will be a use for hydrogen, um, but it will be much, much smaller, as Saul had to say, than the hype that is being out there now suggesting that it's going to be this huge industry and it's going to be the solution to everything. I think there will be small industrial uses for it, but nowhere near the hype that Twiggy Forest is suggesting as being a solution for all the reasons that Saul said in his book, The, uh, the Big Switch. Um, he talks about just that level of inefficiency and says, look, frankly, for things that need electricity, just use electricity and, um, and battery technology is so, it's coming down the cost curve very fast. And not only that, um, it's, it's uh, able to be rolled out in distributed form and so on much more easily. You don't have all the costs associated with managing uh, hide the transport of hydrogen. So because it's inefficient and because it's expensive, that is why they are going to uh, hydro and they're trying to do deals in countries where they think they can minimize the costs to the company and maximize the costs to the community. So I think it has a small small use. It might have a small use in shipping, might have a small use in, uh, in heavy industry. But I think when it comes to transport, you'll find electric vehicles and, and batteries are going to be much, much better and much cheaper. And uh, we have another question and it's open to the panelists uh, from Tanika Naidu. If green hydrogen isn't a suitable alternative, what is considered as the best alternative to gas and current coal-based energy? What will help us reach the just transition we all strive for? Is there one of the speakers who could please answer that? Well, I'd certainly say, Jenny, that um, renewable energy in the form of wind energy and solar energy and, and uh, with batteries uh, is the most, uh, is the best pathway to um, electrifying everything. And it's also the best pathway in terms of developing countries because you can build it locally and you can build it at scale and you can distribute the batteries accordingly. So. Absolutely, that's renewable energy is essential. We have to get out of coal and gas. Carbon capture and storage is a waste of time. It doesn't work, it's very expensive. And I think we're much better off to consider um, local distributed energy based on solar and wind. Uh, any of our other speakers have an answer for that one as well? Daniel's got his hand up. Great, over to you, Daniel. I agree with what was said. I just want to add another component um, that we sometimes focus on technology, but we forget that um, the, it's more than just technology. Mozambique, for example, only has 30% uh, of access to electricity. Um, and, we, and, we, um, it's, and, it's, and a lot of the times the energy poverty is used as a reason to justify this project, but our current capacity is enough to um, supply every Mozambique with energy um, twofold which means that so we confuse capacity with access and access with energy poverty. Um, and that's another thing, because we, need, we have two um, barriers here. It's not just clean energy, it's a socially just and fair energy, and, and there's a justice component to the transition. Um, and we must not forget that. So um, Europe changes, can change its um, from dirty to clean energy, and it's a big chunk of its issues are solved, but it's not the case for Africa. So that's an added on. Whatever tradition we do, we need to look at how it meets people's needs and how and what's the, the just like slavery was clean energy. 
Um, it doesn't mean it was, and, but it was morally unacceptable. And we have to also see this because the energy sector in general has had a lot of crimes, it's, it's taken community land, it's disrespected indigenous rights. And we cannot, we cannot ignore this just by focusing on the carbon component of the equation. Um, so the transition has to be deal with the, in the, the system's tendencies to um, take away land to, uh, um, and not respect people's rights and needs. So I just want to add that component. So, um, and in case of Mozambique, um, alternative energies is more feasible um, because the, um, we have a very small, um, low density population spread throughout big, large areas um, and centralized electricity does not work economically. And it also is, it, there's a lot of advantages that we're not taking advantage um, considering we deal with um, uh, alternative energies. It's very scalable. It's, we can actually meet the demand um, phase by phase, and we don't have to have these big predictions like large scale project, um, dam projects, which is a huge amount of energy coming onto the system at once, causing a crash in the prices, depending on long term predictions, which you get, when you get wrong, you have consequences. With alternative energy, um, you can actually don't have to make these predictions, but it's much easier to match the growth as time goes because it's more, far more modular, and there's a lot of these advantages we're not taking advantage of. Um, so, Africa can skip the dirty energy phase and go straight into alternative energy. Um, we don't have to deal with, it, with transitions as much because we still have most of our population without electricity. So we should look at these countries like Mozambique where the majority of people don't have electricity and skip transition and go straight to that. We did that with cell phones. We did not put landlines everywhere. We went straight to cell phones and as communication. And we should do the same. But instead, Mozambique and countries like Mozambique are seen as where dirty technology goes to die. Mozambique is starting its coal, it's starting its gas. Um, and we need to also um, really focus and not allow um, these industries to falsely use the energy poverty to come to our country. So I think the transition is clean energy, but also, also match it to the, to the needs um, and take advantage of the characteristics of alternative energy as well, other than just the carbon. Thanks. And uh, Emmanuel uh, Masuya, you've also got um, an answer here. And and maybe also while you're speaking, Emmanuel, can you talk a little bit about, do we know if there is any public financing, whether from bilateral or multilateral institutions going towards hydrogen projects around the world? So over to you, Emmanuel. Ok, merci. Euh, je pensais que je devais aussi ajouter un mot sur euh, la question surtout précédente, euh, qui cadrait avec euh, au fait les alternatives qu'il faut, parce que là on dit que l'hydrogène n'est pas bon. Euh, et je pense qu'il nous est aussi arrivé de parler de la grande hydroélectricité qui n'est pas peut-être une solution abordable. Mais je pense que un peu dans le même sens que le précédent, c'est que euh, le grand problème, on a parlé par exemple de la RDC où il y a un grand potentiel énergétique, mais il y a moins de 9% des populations qui a accès à l'électricité. Alors que dans l'entretemps, on, on veut développer des, très, des grands projets énergétiques qui ne visent même pas cette population. Donc ici, euh, l'apport que je voulais amener, c'est qu'il faudrait euh, comme alternative penser à des projets décentralisés à des projets d'énergie renouvelable, certes, mais il y a aussi, par exemple, la micro-hydroélectricité qui peut être développée de façon décentralisée, qui touche directement les communautés locales. Et le développement de ces genres de projets, ça, ça a moins d'impact sur l'environnement, il y a moins d'impact sur euh, l'économie qui, généralement, nous amène à des dettes, il y a moins d'impact sur le social parce que c'est aussi avantageux dans le sens que ça vient développer tout de suite l'économie au niveau local. Donc, à partir de la base, les communautés peuvent développer des activités économiques qui leur permettront justement euh, d'avoir accès à l'énergie et d'avoir des ressources pour euh, leurs autres besoins. Donc, c'est un apport que je voulais apporter. Mais sur l'autre question, malheureusement, le son n'était pas bon, on n'a pas bien capté. Voilà. Okay, yes, let me help you. Oh, I'm lost. I'll come back to you. I The question was, do we know if there is any public financing, whether from bilateral or multilateral institutions going towards hydrogen projects around the world? Uh, 
Ben, je, je pense que l'approche de, de FFI est celui justement de convaincre davantage des, 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 des partenaires multilatérales. Mais pour ce qui concerne la RDC présentement, je pense qu'il n'y euh, a pas encore une information qui fait impliquer au fait ces, ces, ces investisseurs ou des, ces partenaires multilatérales dans euh, les investissements du projet INGA. Par exemple, le cas de la Banque mondiale qui euh, s'est déclarée depuis 2016 n'est pas être concernée par, euh, n'est-ce pas, des financements autour de ce grand projet. Donc, euh, euh, avec l'évolution des choses, peut-être FFI est en train de chercher des, des financements auprès de les différents bailleurs, mais au moins on ne peut pas affirmer aujourd'hui qu'il y a justement cet apport direct de, de ces partenaires multilatérales. Mais euh, la réflexion qui a été faite jusque-là, c'était justement d'identifier qui est derrière FFI. Peut-être que les amis de l'Australie ensemble, on pourra aborder davantage ces aspects. Qui, quelles sont ces entreprises derrière FFI On peut trouver justement des entreprises peut-être norvégiennes, on peut trouver des entreprises chinoises qui ne sont pas forcément liés euh, tout de suite à des institutions euh, financières internationales. Mais néanmoins, ça reste une piste sur laquelle il faut davantage à, aborder pour avoir plus d'informations, surtout en ce qui concerne le projet d'hydrogène qui, qui est en voie de développement. Thank you very much. And uh, Eric Kasongo, you have your um, hand up and please go ahead. Oui, uh, merci beaucoup, Jenny. <coughs> Peut-être pour compléter, Emmanuel, uh, ce qu'il faut ajouter ici, je pense, c'est que le marché d'hydrogène est un marché en pleine expansion. Uh, les côtés uh, mauvais dans l'expansion de ces marchés c'est qu'il n'est pas tout de suite lié à des marchés financiers. C'est-à-dire quoi Il n'y a pas directement au niveau des marchés ou des institutions multilatérales de, de financement un intérêt porté sur le projet. La stratégie de FFI, d'après les constats que nous, nous avons faits, c'est de s'appuyer sur euh, les engagements des États par rapport à la réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre et de proposer cela au niveau des États ou des organisations qui luttent pour la réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre comme étant une des solutions futures idéales sur lesquelles le monde doit s'appuyer et qu'il ne faut pas euh, le rater. C'est ça la stratégie. Après, le marché financier vient après. Nous, nous avons eu localement euh, une session où nous avons été invités pour participer à, à une sorte de coming out de, 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 de FFI à RDC qui voulait partager un peu les travaux qu'ils font sur le terrain. La grande question euh, qui, qui, qui n'est pas apparue dans les différents slides qui ont été présentés, c'est qui finance FFI Parce que d'accord, avec la RDC, il y a un MOU. Euh, Andrew Forrest a promis de mobiliser, pas d'apporter, mais de mobiliser 100 milliards de dollars. Mais à la question de savoir qui met la main dans la poche, qui apporte ces 100 milliards de dollars, eh bien justement, la réponse a été que non, voilà, ça se passe comme dans d'autres projets. Lorsque nous, nous sommes là, nous sommes là pour négocier d'abord le contrat. Une fois que nous avons le contrat, eh bien, nous irons sur les marchés eh, financiers. Et, et je pense que c'est le scénario dans lequel euh, euh, Fortescue Future NDC s'inscrit. Et il y a toute une série d'alliances euh, qui se sont tissées euh, euh, par des pays, euh, parfois les, les plus émetteurs des, des gaz à effet de serre, dans le cadre des engagements à, à décarboner les, les économies. C'est à travers ces alliances-là que, justement, les projets FFI pour la production de l'hydrogène est en train de s'insérer et euh, identifier les financements. À ce que je sache, au jour d'aujourd'hui, euh, peut-être qu'un euh, un des intervenants ici peut nous, peut, peut, peut nous apporter l'information, je ne connais pas une institution multilatérale qui porte un intérêt particulier sur le développement euh, de, de l'hydrogène vert jusqu'à présent. Peut-être si on nous apporte l'information, ça serait... Ça serait vraiment euh, une plus-value pour nous, un plus pour nous. Mais nous sommes en train de chercher justement à comprendre quelles sont les institutions multilatérales qui portent un intérêt pour, pour, pour ces projets. Mais j'avais aussi une autre préoccupation, je voulais intervenir. Peut-être Pablo, euh, j'ai beaucoup aimé la présentation de, 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 de Pablo euh, sur euh, euh, les questions des, 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 des banques, des assurances et des investissements. Une des questions qui revient dans 
les préoccupations que la société civile congolaise se pose, c'est de savoir, est-ce que les tendances actuelles des marchés sont propices à un développement euh, rapide, justement, de ces marchés des, euh, de, de l'hydrogène, tel que c'est vendu Parce que l'élément le, le, clé dans les deals qui sont en train de se faire, et je rappelle que euh, au moment où nous parlons, à, à Paris, se déroule une réunion entre, entre FFI et, et, et les partenaires de la RDC où ils sont en train de voir comment euh, amender les MOU de 2020 et ainsi de suite. Donc, la, la motivation qui amène le gouvernement congolais, d'après ce que nous, nous avons compris, à s'engager, c'est le fait que c'est le contrat de siècle, c'est le nouvel Eldorado, c'est comme on, ils ont dit dans, on a dit dans les slides, les champions dans la protection de l'environnement, mais aussi il euh, y a quelque chose qui sous-tend cet, cet élément de champion de l'environnement, c'est que les marchés vont répondre positivement. Les marchés européens, et ça explique les différents contrats sur la vente des hydrogènes que eh, Andrew Forrest a déjà négocié avec les États-Unis, le Japon et, et, et la Grande-Bretagne. Alors, peut-être question pour Pablo, est-ce que ces marchés-là existent On le sent, les marchés de l'hydrogène, au niveau international. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And unfortunately, Pablo has, has to have to leave us, but I we have a recording of this, so I will pass it to uh, Pablo and ask him to reach out to you on that a very good question. But I know that Christine has some thoughts about this too. And one of the questions, Christine, is that um, one of the question, one of our participants in the audience asked, uh, what are your thoughts on where you see Twiggy, Forest and FFI most vulnerable, which is, is part of the um, same question that Eric just asked us. What would you see as priority strategies to undercut the financing and political support in the global north. Okay, so the first thing is that Fortescue Future Industries, which is the, the company signing these MOUs everywhere, is a subsidiary of Fortescue Metals Group, and they are the ones making multi-billion dollar profits out of exporting iron ore to China predominantly. And so 10% of the profits of the Fortescue Metal Group goes to funding Fortescue Future Industries. So the problem we have, it is the fourth largest iron ore exporter in the world. It is a huge, rich co uh, company with very strong links into the financial sector, obviously, because of that. And so there's, there's not the same level of vulnerability that a smaller company might have because they've already, they're already starting with a substantial place in the market. So, but in terms of their vulnerability, it is the over hyping of hydrogen as a solution to climate because we need the climate activists to step up and say, no, it is not going to have anywhere near the application that you are suggesting and to educate those governments, particularly in Germany, particularly in the UK. We know that they've signed those agreements already with two companies, one in the UK and one in Germany. We can start, as Pablo suggested, targeting those companies with information and seeing where they where we get with that and with the German government to not buy any uh, hydrogen that's generated out of building new hydro anywhere in Africa or Papua New Guinea. But a couple of things you've said tonight, Eric, are real vulnerabilities for Twiggy Forest in Australia and in the global north. And that is that you said that what he's done with the MOU is to violate the law of the Congo in terms of how tenders are let. And I think that's a vulnerability for them to bring uh, attention to the fact that they are not behaving within the laws of the, of the company. And the second thing is you said that the MOU includes, um, as I understood what you said, includes uh, paragraphs or conditions to say that uh, the Congo can't release the MOU publicly. So I think forcing the public release of the MOU is something that we can campaign on here in Australia. So I think we need to start working out some of their vulnerabilities to their pitch about their green. Well, you can't be green if you're corrupt, if you're secretive, you lack transparency. 
And if there are um, no conditions uh, that that the people that the people can't actually see. So from from many of the things tonight, you've given us some ideas of how we might start actually taking on Twiggy in some of these global fora. But it's it's the fact is he's one of the world's wealthiest people, and as such, he can basically buy his way in anywhere. And as I said, showed in the slides, the launch of that global institution to promote green hydrogen that is his. He paid for the launch. He paid for everyone to go there. He paid for a whole lot of delegates. He paid for everything. So when you've got that amount of money, you can convert something into appearing to have a lot of influence when in fact, it's all just coming from the one place. But anyway, we will work on some of those things you've identified. Thanks so much, Christine. And we um, are, I, I'm conscious of time and I would like to wrap up by 8 p.m. in five minutes. So I would just like one more um, really important final question. And if Eric um, is happy to answer or Emmanuel, is the, the real um, question is, is that what is the destruction to the environment around green hydrogen? Is it that the impact from the green hydrogen projects on the environment, or is it because of their link to dams? Um, do the projects on their own also pose danger to biodiversity and environment? So I hope I've asked that clearly enough, but yes, the question is for one of you to answer about what is the problem with these destructive projects and their impacts on the environment? Euh, merci beaucoup, euh, Jenny. Et je pense que c'est une question euh, très, 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 très intéressante et euh, très, très importante surtout à comprendre euh, pour, pour, pour tous ceux qui sont, qui sont dans cette audience. Mais heureusement, mais, 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 mais le fait est que c'est une question très technique. Vous voyez, nous, nous avons posé des préoccupations en tant que société civile pour chercher à comprendre les dangers qu'il peut y avoir à présenter hydrogène vert comme une solution climatique. Je pense que le premier intervenant, si je ne m'abuse, je pense que le deuxième, Chris, euh, qui a parlé, euh, le volet technique peut être à même de mieux répondre à, 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 à cette question. Parce que d'un point de vue pratique, jusqu'à présent, le projet, on nous parle d'hydrogène, mais le scénario complet, le partage des études et tout ça et qu'on sort, ça fait des choses que nous, nous sommes dans le besoin pour assimiler, pour comprendre. Vous voyez, cette session est une des sessions pour nous permettre, euh, en écoutant des gens comme euh, Chris, euh, Madame Christine ou encore Pablo, ou, 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 tout ça, c'est pour nous permettre de mieux, mieux comprendre. Mais pour savoir s'il si y a un véritable danger, j'ai vu la question dans le chat, je pense que Chris euh, est mieux à même de pouvoir revenir ré 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 sur quelques éléments de sa présentation de tout à l'heure et apporter cette précision. Merci. Peut-être juste une chose avant, je ne sais pas si Chris prendra la parole. Je pense que comme l'a dit Maître Eric, les impacts directement liés à l'hydrogène restent à définir sur base de l'expertise à développer. Mais je pense qu'en sortant de ce webinaire, on a certainement besoin de comprendre que le lien est plutôt direct avec le barrage à ce stade. Ce que nous essayons de dire, c'est que le développement d'un projet d'hydrogène sur le fleuve Congo aura un impact direct parce qu'il s'agit tout d'abord de construire le grand barrage Dinga. Et construire le grand barrage Dinga, c'est carrément sacrifier l'avenir de toute une communauté, de tout un peuple, et surtout tenant compte des accords qui sont développés. Comme vous le savez, le grand Inga aura beaucoup d'impact, qu'il soit sur l'environnement, qu'il soit sur le social et sur l'économie du pays. Donc, il faut noter que le lien qui est établi actuellement entre le problème de l'hydrogène vert qui est présenté à l'étranger, c'est surtout lié aux impacts qu'aura ce grand barrage qui sera développé sur le fleuve Congo, qui privera euh, de l'énergie à la population congolaise alors qu'elle en a besoin, qui va détruire l'écosystème du fleuve Congo, qui va faire en sorte que des, des milliers de populations soient déplacées de leur site. On avait parlé de ceux qui seront déplacés de Inga. Mais au-delà de Inga, il y a plusieurs autres localités ou cités. Toute une, toute une ville, on peut dire, de Luozi, toute une cité de Luozi sera complètement délocalisée de leur site. Et comprenez que jusqu'à aujourd'hui, il n'y a pas d'études d'impact environnemental. On ne sait pas si ces impacts, comment est-ce qu'ils seront gérés, où est-ce que ces populations seront amenées par la suite. Donc, comprenez que 
Le problème qu'on peut identifier à ce stade, en dehors d'entrer sur des questions techniques qui nécessitent justement une, une, un, un approfondissement, c'est vraiment tous les impacts que le grand barrage pourra apporter. Voilà donc ce que je voulais euh, apporter comme contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I do understand that there are questions that haven't been able to be asked tonight. And I will ask our International Rivers um, colleagues to ask the presenters to answer those questions and send them out because we do have your email contacts. It's just been such a full evening of such great information that um, we've packed it in so much and we're running over time. I do apologize about the time we're taking here tonight, but it's so important. And um, I would like to just now introduce Damata Coffey, who is going to wrap us all up about what the next steps are and what follow up actions are, because it's so important to receive all the information and then to work together to take action and, and that's our motto here at the Bob Brown Foundation is taking action for earth. Um, Damata Coffey is a senior campaigner at International Rivers Africa program and I would like to welcome her now to speak with us for the next um, wrap up. Thank you. Thanks Jenny. Um, I'll be really quick. Um, hi everyone and thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. Um, we recognize the importance of the topics we've discussed today and the need for um, concerted action. There are quite a number of additional issues um, and topics that we haven't been able to discuss today, um, including the current trends um, in terms of green hydrogen markets and also their influence on the energy transition discourse. Um, we have discussed the possibility of a second webinar, which will focus on this important topic. And this will also be an opportunity for us to delve um, deeper into the conversations and also exchange on what collective actions we can take both at regional and also at global levels to, uh, to reduce reliance on green hydrogen. So we are really, really looking forward to linking up with you all, especially those of you based in the UK and Germany, as we have discussed today, to challenge these deals and also, um, yeah, to focus on both the, the companies and then the, the parliament um, in those respective countries. Then also we have coming up um, as part of our energy uh, series, uh, we are hoping to explore other topics like micro hydro throughout the course of the year. So please do keep your eyes open for these events um, as we will be reaching out. In terms of immediate next steps to this uh, webinar, we will share the presentations with you all. And also since we have recorded the events, we will share the, the recording as well so that you can always refer to it anytime. For the questions, as Jenny mentioned, for the questions we haven't been able to answer, we have taken note of them all and we'll make sure to reach out to you via email and in the meantime if you have any additional questions if you have any um, information you would like to share with us please feel free um, to reach out and we'll make sure to, to to respond the contact details will be shared in the in the chat shortly so yeah i'll stop there let's continue our next steps via email and thank you so so much for staying with us till now thank you Thank you to you. And, and it was really um, the work of, of uh, Damata Kofi and Siziwe Murta bringing us together this evening. And we're very thankful to International Rivers. Um, I've noticed in the chats, people from all over the world. In so, it's so great to have you from all over the world joining us tonight. And we know that this is a very important topic to keep coming together um, across the globe and talk about it more. Uh, I understand too, some great points in there around sharing the links from the chat. And I'm sure that those will be going to you via your email as well. Um, important links that were put in the chat this evening. Um, my wrap up here is a very big thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, incredible to have people from uh, Mozambique, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, other parts of Africa and the Australian um, great crew of Christine Milne and Pablo Brait and Saul Griffith. Um, thank you for joining us tonight and it's been a great pleasure to be the 
MC on behalf of the Bob Brown Foundation from our little island um, in Lutruwita, Tasmania, um, south of Australia. So thank you everyone. And uh, we will meet again, I'm sure, and uh, fight for real climate solutions, which we know are there and are definitely not uh, the ones that are being put forward by billionaires that just want to keep making money and profit rather than protect the environment and people and take action really for climate justice. So I'd like to thank you all again and so, so great you could stay with us for 35 minutes longer than we promised. Uh, thank you to our speakers too. And our interpreters, thank you so much for interpreting for us tonight. <laughs>